Thanks so much for that great introduction. Um, I am not sure what you said before that. Sorry, I do not speak German, um, but I'm sure it was beautiful. <laughs> um, so just to jump off from that a little bit, a little bit more about myself. Um, as was mentioned, I um, am a PhD student, so I'm back in, go ahead. Jessica, sorry to uh -huh. interrupt. Is there a chance that you can speak up a bit and we on our, on our end can try and turn up the volume just a bit? Um, um, yeah, I'm, I can, I can try to, Sorry, yes, just, I can just try to speak louder. No worries. <laughs> Thanks. Animals on the room. They did do some testing, I, I assure you. <laughs> it, is that better at all? I think it's better, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. I'm getting thumbs up here. All right. Sorry okay. for, for interrupting. No worries. I want to make sure people can hear. <laughs> Otherwise, there's no point in talking. Um, so, um, yeah. So, I am back in the academic realm, but I spent a number of years um, working at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. That's that little butterfly at the bottom, um, where I was a data projects manager um, and worked um, a lot with connecting scientists to data sets and trying to get data sets from scientists, um, a lot of it in between there. Um, and there I, I, lear I really learned the importance of open science and a lot of tools um, that can be used to facilitate open science. Um, so that, I always like to say that I um, definitely fell for open science there, um, but now being back in the academic realm, um, I'm reminded of the limitations of open science, so that's something I'm gonna um, touch on a little bit here um, as well. Um, so I think that kind of gives me a unique perspective into all this, um, and I'm just gonna share some of that with you today. Um, so how do I move this? Um, so what am I gonna talk about? So today um, I wanna kind of talk a little bit about what is open science, um, get us kind of all on the same page, um, at least what my definition is. Um, another thing I was asked to talk about why is open science so important, um, which is definitely an important topic of conversation. So I'll talk about that from a couple of perspectives. Um, and then I kind of want to bring in my experience about why it makes this so hard, um, what are the limitations, um, and then what we can do, kind of try to end on a higher note, what we can do to make um, open science move forward a little bit. And so it's a little bit of a roller coaster. Um, <laughs> This is great, but it's hard, but we can do this, so um, bear with me here. Um, so um, I found this paper that was published a couple of months ago um, that did a systematic lit review of the definitions of open science. And this is what they came up with, um, that open science is a transparent and um, accessible knowledge that is shared and developed through collaborative networks, um, which is kind of what we all think of, I think, when we think of open science, but it's still pretty general um, and doesn't really tell us what, how to do it and what people are expecting. Um, so when I think of open science, I think of it as more of transparency and communication um, in this kind of old fashioned scientific method that we all learned in primary school. Um, so I pulled this poster off of um, a primary um, education uh, website because um, it kind of keeps keep those simple steps and I want to walk through a couple ways that open science can be used um, in throughout this whole process. Um, so, um, oh, I also add publish there at the bottom because now that we're adults, that's a big part of the scientific process. Um, so this first part I think of as planning, um, basically thinking of what the problems are, um, deciding what questions are important, how you're gonna approach those things. Um, and there's a number of tools online um, for sharing that information, doing a little bit of exploring. Um, obviously, Wikimedia Suite is also part of this um, communication hub. Um, some people are taking and making it a little bit more personal, designing their own blogs, um, th their own open notebooks for this kind of investigation part. Um, but I think the important part is really like opening up that um, communication and exploration um, 
to the outside world. Um, and this can be just direct communication with your colleagues or experts in the field, um, reach out at conferences or at your own institution. Um, and I think this part of it is often overlooked because I think people are getting more and more protective and closed about their ideas and communication. So I just wanted to highlight this as that this, this doesn't count <laughs> as um, open science. Um, so when you move on to the actual doing work part of this, um, a lot of the same tools can be used. Again, communicating with people, is this um, a legitimate approach? Um, how do you use these methods? Um, I added GitHub because that's, that's a great one for tracking um, the progress um, in real time of what you're doing. Um, it's great versioning capabilities. Um, but again, kind of keeping that, that process transparent. And I like those open notebooks because it does put out there that through this process, there's there are some hiccups, there are some mistakes. And so having that as an open conversation is, is important to, to science, I think. Um, I also want to highlight here that methods are kind of becoming, method sections of publications are kind of becoming um, less transparent where it's harder and harder to take a paper and actually completely re reproduce the results. We cite other um, methods and think that that's enough, but don't touch, don't say that we did this in a different place or give enough details about that other place or how we've changed things. So um, just asking people to be really careful about making sure that your science is reproducible. Um, and I know journals are kind of cutting down on these sections a little bit, but they have those um, supplemental materials you can put stuff in um, to really make sure that it's clear what you did. Um, so this last part I call sharing results. Um, I kind of co-opt the conclusion section as the writing process. Um, and this this part of the writing process is kind of the least priority, I think, for a lot of people in being using the open science methods. Um, but there's tools like Authoria uh, partners or can be linked to GitHub and um, you can version your writing process like that and make it publicly available if you want to people to see your errors. Um, on a smaller scale, kind of more with more collaborative groups, uh, tools like Dropbox and um, the Google Suite um, are good for sharing versions and stuff. But like I said, these are kind of the, the, the least priority in the, in the process. Um, obviously, when you get to publishing, it's great to look for open access journals. Um, the PLOS Suite is, has a number of journals that are open access. Um, Nature and Science have their own open access journals at this point. So if you're kind of looking at for that higher impact factors, you can still find those in open access form. Um, but your work doesn't end there with publishing, which it kind of does in people's minds, right? Like you also want to be sharing your data to make those methods completely transparent. Um, and there's a number of repositories where you can uh, do those. And I, I'll talk a little bit later about benefits to this researcher for those. Um, but making sure that you're making that available. Um, and then again, it doesn't end there, <laughs> but wait, there's more. Um, I think science communication is really important. As scientists, we communicate through these journal articles, but the public isn't looking for those. And so to really increase the impact of your work, um, translating it into something, uh, the public is interested in and will will read. So like a blog post or even commenting on Twitter or um, talking to local news sources um, will really increase the impact um, and um, amount of people that will read your science. Um, so that was kind of a lot that I just gave you guys. Um, so there's a lot of tools, there's a lot of things to think about. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why it's important to make to motivate people to um, dig into some of this. Um, so why is open science so important? For the broader scientific community, um, it's important because as I mentioned in the beginning, it's really just adding that transparency that was always intended for science back into the scientific process. So um, being able to check each other on um, methods and results. <clears throat> um, it also helps the scientific community to increase efficiency. So instead of having two different groups working on the same project, um, maybe in different ways, or looking at different pieces of it separately, bringing them together, um, having them have that conversation to address these issues, um, hopefully more efficiently, collaboratively, um, and hopefully to get um, a better answer and make 
um, be able to um, get more work done in the end, really. Um, and something that's not thought about as much, really, um, is equity and diversity. Um, if, you know, the big institutions are getting all the money to do all do big research, um, but that's all kept within their doors or within a couple other institutions, then that really limits um, our progress. So if these, these results and data and methods are made more openly available, then um, minority groups, young scientists, institutions with fewer resources can also have access to them and contribute in ways that um, we would have completely missed otherwise. And um, I'm not sure anybody would uh, disagree with the fact that having more, more minds and more diverse perspectives on a problem um, will, in the end, give us, give us better solutions. Um, so, when we're looking at the individual scientists, why would I um, work to focus on implementing these tools, um, focus on data science? Um, for the individual scientists, it can also increase efficiency. So, while learning to code or preparing your data for sharing, does take more time and can be frustrating at the beginning. Um, in the end, these tools are made to help, so it will end up benefiting you. So a little work now will make your science into a way that um, will be easier in the, in the future. Um, also, be community recognition, being a participant on these uh, online forums and uh, in communication groups can really help boost your um, identity in, in your field. Um, Fields like uh, computer science and such have kind of more built in ways to track and give recognition for the, this kind of participation, but other fields are um, becoming more and more um, cognizant of, of that kind of participation. Um, and it just more generally kind of introduces you to more people in your field. Um, in that vein, it can also foster collaboration. So instead of um, keeping your ideas to yourself and not knowing who else is working on this. You can meet new people that are working on similar things or might have a unique perspective that you would want to bring into your work. Um, so across the world or somebody you meet at a conference or something. So that's, that's a, a fun way to open up your science. Um, and then finally, it can increase the value of your data. So if you publish your data online, um, someone can find it who might want to bring in, again, a different perspective or use your data for something that you either wouldn't have thought of or might not even be interested in doing. So if you're studying, if you're an ecologist and you study the biomass of rabbits and you're interested in maybe looking at how an invasive species impacts your rabbits or how um, uh, getting rid of predators and invasive impacts the rabbits, then that's kind of your realm. But somebody might come in and say, what about policy issues? Like, how does that affect your rabbits? And they might, you might want to collaborate with them in that, or they might just take that and either cite your data. So that gives your data more value for you um, as a scientist, or they can include you as an author. So that directly gives you um, more uh, papers on your, on your CV. So those kinds of things can actually really directly help you um, from sharing your data. Um, so if there's all these great things, why aren't more people doing it, right? Um, so there are limitations. So as a data manager, um, the project we did looking for, um, so we went after data projects um, funded by a certain agency, um, and I wrote a paper about what um, the success or lack thereof <laughs> that we had in that process. So we went out and asked scientists for their data that was supposed to be publicly available. And we only got 25, 26% of those projects, um, which is a little bit disappointing. Um, but this was kind of the biggest response that we got. Um, it's gonna take too much extra work for me to pull those data together and give to you. Um, and whether that means extra time, extra money, people, some people did ask directly for uh, compensation, even though the original funding was their compensation um, or resources to do this. Um, uh, public government agencies that we worked with um, did specifically ask for, um, they said, we know as a public agency that these data should be public, but we just straight up don't have the time and do not have the personnel to do it. So um, that's definitely even um, a, a real limitation for people. Um, another uh, 
hurdle to sharing my most of my experience data, but using open science in general, are cultural fears, um, which are really perpetuated by our reward system in science. Um, but fears of people stealing your ideas, getting scooped, um, losing funding. So someone stealing your ideas and taking all the funding for that. Um, and then also others finding out that you're wrong. So if you're not completely comp confident in the work you did or your results, maybe you'll be a little bit less transparent so that people can't find that out. And whether that's intentional or unintentional, um, that's a, a fear that I've definitely heard um, from people. So these ones are a little bit harder to find solutions for since it's really based on this whole um, um, culture that we have in science. Um, so there are also institutional limitations. So um, data ownership, I work with a lot of uh, industry partners who actually own the data and the data is a way that they make money. So that's a definitely a limitation. I can't share those data and have to do um, some gymnastics to, um, to be able to make my work transparent. Um, there's also sharing limitations as far as this is the way that we have things in this format and whether that's conducive to other people using it or not is, you know, um, not always, not always helpful. Um, as far as funding limitations, there's definitely limitations to um, sharing data as far as, as I said, with the, the government agencies, just not having the um, personnel or time to do it. Um, also, open access journals tend to have fees, which can be limiting to using open access journals. Um, and then also publish or perish, this kind of publish or perish attitude um, and having number of publications be um, your currency for promotion or keeping your job, that adds pressure to kind of keep things to yourself and be selfish about your work. So um, these are kind of things that um, are more rules that make um, open science a little bit more difficult. Um, so what can we do about it? I want to start with what we can do on the individual level. Um, there's a couple things and then what kind of the bigger institutional groups um, can do also to help move the open science movement forward. Um, so the first thing I want to mention is just try learning some of these tools. They're, they're a little bit tough to begin with, but again, they will be, um, they will pay off in the end. Um, it will really make your, your life a little bit easier, whether that's you know, jumping in and trying them all or incorporating one at a time um, to try to see how they might improve your workflow. Um, another one a little bit more abstract is trying to like start changing your mindset um, to think about how collaboration can help your science or um, how, um, sorry, there's an airplane outside. <laughs> Um, um, incorporating and actually living up to scientific ethics. Um, I know an ethics professor who is one of the least ethical scientists I know, so it's easy to talk about, but actually incorporating into your work is, is difficult. Um, and then finally, um, bringing trust back into science. Um, and that's kind of similar to this mindset thing, but um, the best way to do that is just being honest with your colleagues, um, attributing people when they deserve to be attributed um, and try to have kind of set that example for um, other scientists you interact with. Um, so that's on kind of the individual level uh, at the higher, at bigger institutional level, um, funders and uh, publication journals um, also have a big role to play here. So um, a lot of them have had um, requirements to share data, um, attribute people correctly, um, have thorough methods. They've all, that's all kind of been in place for a long time now, but the um, regulations have been pretty lax on them. So they said, oh yeah, yeah, my data is somewhere and I can give it to people whenever. Um, but I just wanted to use this um, Arctic Data Center as an example of kind of a way that they can be a little bit more strict about those things. Um, so this is the National Science Foundation, which is the United States big funding agency. Um, and as a government funding agency, their data are public goods. So they have to be made public. The Arctic Data Center is a um, online uh, data repository that the, the NSF set up for the data of for their projects um, in the, um, that are based in the Arctic. 
And so this is a place where all the projects that they fund need to put their data, um, I'm sure they have some sort of exceptions, but need to um, store their data before they will be considered for additional funding. Um, and just generally to wrap up their entire um, project. That, that's kind of the requirement. Um, and it's, it's great because they provide a location, which is rare, doesn't happen that much yet. Um, and then they also provide a data support team. So if you have issues or are running out of time, um, they can help you format your data, know what the data should look like, um, document your data. Um, they provide digital object identifiers and full citations. So um, if someone goes in here and uses this uh, council climate and car data set, they'll know exactly how to attribute it and it will be linked right back to you with an ORCID ID. Um, so they kind of build all of that and provide that for the scientists. And I think that's a great use of their, their funding um, and brings out a lot more data than um, would otherwise. Um, so that's, that's a great example of how you can do it. I mean, um, this is a funder and journals can provide the same service, um, but it really shows that these big um, institutions are really moving towards um, making open science, here specifically data, um, but a priority um, for them as well. Um, so from there, I just kind of want to end on, usually these talks end saying, these are the things we need to do, go do them. Um, I kind of wanted to take a different tact because being in academia and seeing kind of those both sides, I know that there are limitations. So I kind of want to say, do what you can. Um, have, start incorporating new tools when you can, maybe one per project, one per year. Um, start opening up your communication, push your boundaries a little bit, go out on a limb a little bit. Um, and if everybody here starts incorporating that, then that will be great progress. Um, so yeah, that's all I kind of have so far. Um, if you guys have any questions, I will, um, if we have time for questions, I will definitely take those. Well, let me say thank you then directly to the camera. Um, and then quickly turn around in case <laughs> any one of you has any questions, comments, anything like that, please feel free. Also, this is, this is my pretty picture of Santa Barbara. This is where I'm <laughs> located. It's not quite that sunny yet today, but <laughs> yeah, not I, a bad place. I don't think you'll see any pictures from what it looks like around here after seeing <laughs> <laughs> Here's one. Please do come up so that Jessica can actually see you. Yes. Yeah. And follow me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And the <laughs> or, or just, can I'll you hear me, Jessica? No. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, hi. So I'm Toby. And um, I was wondering whether you have collected some experience with talking to older, more senior scientists who are maybe running a department or so on, because I find that they're usually the hardest to convince and these things and policies should be implemented, and if you have any tips for us. Yeah, definitely, I definitely have. And it's, it's a mixed bag um, here because um, I've worked with a lot of scientists at the Synthesis Science Center, because so doing that kind of work, it kind of is conducive to um, appreciating the open science, science um, framework because you need other people's data to do science with synthesis science. Um, so I've definitely run into both, um, I worked with a a scientist who is like, don't talk to people, don't tell people what we're doing, don't share your data. Um, so the best way to do that is to, um, I, it kind of depends on how stubborn they are. You know, you can start talking to them, um, showing them the benefits of it as you're incorporating it into your science, say, oh, look, um, I connected with somebody across the world because I, ha I was part of this forum or I have my blog. Um, and so that's a good way to do it. Um, or show them some of the benefits of like, oh, I found these data over here because they were available. Um, so stuff like that is is kind of a, a good way to start easing it into them, but some some of them are just set in their ways. <laughs> so I understand that that's hard too. <laughs> Does that get to it, Toby? Okay. Anyone else? Questions, comments? Okay, because I actually have a question if you don't. Um, oh, there. Hi. Hi. Uh, can you see me? Uh, hear me? I, think we have yeah. to move. I don't think so. Bit. I'm Alex. Hi. 
Um, do you have any comments? I saw in your presentation you showed some open access journals like scientific reports. Do you have any comments on publishing your data or findings in a journal like this uh, versus uploading them on BioArchive or Open Archive or just uploading a, a PDF of an up unpublished version of your manuscript? Um, so sorry, half of that question was about where to put your data um, versus making, well, sharing. Just uploading it as a PDF of your manuscript versus publishing mm -hmm. it in, a, in an open access journal. Um, yeah, so um, I think, so publishing in an open access journal is um, really a good way to do it because people are looking for your data there. Um, people, um, I think I mentioned, I was meant to mention, that people do do self-publishing um, and that's a great way to do it, but it's it kind of tends to miss some of those big um, publication repositories and search um, search locations. So it might be easier to find if it's in an open access journal itself um, because that already has its avenues for, for finding people. Um, but I think they're both great. I mean, ResearchGate is um, a way um, to even if once your your publication is able to be public or um, um, if you're able to share it um, to connect with people, even if it's just your own PDF. So, so there's definitely avenues. Um, I'd say open access journals are great because they, they are connected to people already, but um, they're both great. Okay. Was there a data question there also? <laughs> um. Uh, Alex seems satisfied, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Comments? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry I have to make you come all, all the way up here. <laughs> no, that's all right. So thanks for a really great talk. Um, one thing, and maybe that's a mix of a question and a comment, I noticed that in the beginning when you uh, presented the tours, uh, most of them are actually part of a proprietary infrastructure and it's hard to reuse, for example, data that is shared in FigShare, uh, in, in, in ResearchGate, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. And so my question or my comment was, do you think that also open infrastructure is part of open science and do you um, consider that when choosing tours or, or don't you think that it's important? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So um, different tools are, are, have different strengths, right? So ResearchGate is great for, um, I think I think the benefit of ResearchGate is um, as a communication tool is ways to find people and um, connect with people that are, have similar interests to you. Um, but yeah, finding actual materials and information, you usually have to ask to reach out and ask if I can direct them forward or something. So there's definitely better places. Um, the Wikimedia suite is a great place to find um, actual materials. And yeah, I think open open access and um, even open source is is the best way to go. So stuff like you know Python and R, everybody can download. And so those are great, um, great ways, great platforms to be working on um, because you know when you share it, anybody can access the um, software. To, to use it, stuff like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? It does feel a bit weird, doesn't it? <laughs> so in case you guys don't have any more comments or questions, I think Jessica put up her email, which I'm just going to read out loud if that's okay for okay. you. Um, that's J Couture, um, that's J-C-O-U-T-U-R-E at bren.ucsb.edu. So please do follow up uh, with her um, afterwards if you feel like it. But I'm pretty sure that you've given us lots of things to talk about throughout the evening, so okay. thank you for that. Um, okay. <laughs> thank you also for um, basically looking at the screen and this room instead of looking out the window to, into this um, <laughs> quite mag <laughs> magnificent bay. Um, <laughs> I think that's worth a round of applause, isn't it? <laughs>